Well, hello everybody, and um, this is our first lecture for Art History Survey for Arrival University. And um, during uh, during this course of lectures, we will um, we will cover something like um, over thirty thousand years of uh, art. And um, uh, well, needless to say, we'll slow down by the time we get to about three thousand BC or so. But then, even after that, we'll be galloping through a considerable amount of information, but stopping for pit stops where it's um, most important. Um, well, here we begin. And we begin, appropriately, uh, about 30,000 years ago. And um, it's still us ice age in, um, in Europe. And uh, humanity lives in caves. And we were very fortunate um, to find those caves, a number of those caves. Uh, now, they don't just exist in Europe, they also exist, I mean, they exist everywhere in Africa and Asia, but we'll be concentrating on the European ones. And the ones we'll be looking at, um, particularly, will be one is uh, called the Chauvet, and that's named after its discoverer, and another one is Lascaux, and all of that is central southern France, or Altamira, which is in northwestern Spain. And uh, what is astonishing is that at a very, very early age, uh, back 30,000 BC, as I said, um, humanity already had enough sophistication to abstract what they saw around them into pictures. Because, um, frankly, all art is abstracted to a certain degree. Even the art uh, that, is, that look, appears to us very natural, even photography, uh, because uh, a photograph takes, uh, takes this split moment of time, but then things change in real life. On the photograph, they will not. So that split moment of time is now abstracted from its reality. And that to uh, a smaller or to a lesser or greater degree will, um, will be true for all art. And the fact that humanity began to do it that early uh, is very, very impressive. Now, as I said, the, um, the important things we'll be looking at, uh, these caves that I showed you, there's also a place called Willendorf, and that is in Austria. Another one is Chernavoda, Romania. So, for now, these are the places we will go to. And you, you understand, this is, of course, the, um, uh, the map of Europe. Uh, now, people lived in caves, as I said, um, and the interesting part about it is that um, they lived, uh, they lived in, uh, in the entrance of the caves, and while uh, much art is found in the entrance, still uh, a lot of it is also found along these tunnels, which, um, which are not easily accessible, one actually have to crawl there. And as a result of which, um, many questions, of course, came up as to what was it about? Why did they do it? Was it uh, sympathetic magic? Um, I, draw, I draw a deer, a deer, will a real deer appear to me. Um, I, I uh, discharge uh, a stone at that deer, perhaps uh, my real stone in life will reach the real deer and I will kill him. Um, was it some sort of a cult? Uh, was it anything else? The question is, no one knows. There are a thousand theories, no one knows exactly what this is, was about. Because this is the period of uh, prehistory. What we call prehistory is the time, essentially, before writing. So everything before writing, we must uh, rely on cave discoveries. and. Uh, attempt to use our common sense uh, and, and hope that it will connect us to the people who lived 35,000 um, years ago. So, we do not know. Uh, we will be looking, let's see, uh, this is, of course, these uh, imaginations uh, of what these people looked like, uh, how they survived, what they did, uh, and here are the cave dwellers. Uh, if you go to the, when it opens, 
to the New York Museum of Natural History, you'll find a whole section dedicated to, uh, to prehistoric humans. And uh, this is one of their uh, exponents right here. Uh, the, uh, the tools that they used were stone tools, of course. And roughly, this is a very, very rough division. In reality, the subdivision extends on far, far uh, greater. And the very proximate division is lithic is stone. So Paleolithic is, Paleo is old, lithic stone, old stone age. And these um, divisions are based on the use of tools. So the, in the old stone age, and that is counted from 3 million BC, to approximately um, 12,000 BC in Europe. Again, now these divisions are different from different continents and from, and even in Europe, uh, they are they are subdivided for different places. Then the Mesolithic period, which is Meso, is middle, lithic stone. Mesolithic period is the Middle Stone Age, and which lasted from about 12,000 to about 5,000, and finally we come to Neolithic, which is the New Stone Age. And uh, the, uh, the tools you see here are um, those of the Neolithic period. Back to our cave. Here we are. And what we see are these, um, these extraordinary uh, paintings that, um, that are clearly done with, um, with powdered ochre, either yellow or red, that perhaps was blown through a reed or blown through, uh, through a hollow bone. Uh, charcoal is also used, mixed perhaps with some fats, so that it would adhere uh, for, for outlines. And even though you see uh, a number of uh, animals here, it's not necessary that they were all painted at the same time. It's very possible that generations after generations painted them on top of one another, and what we may see as a herd, in fact, may not have been Originally. Now, the exact purpose, as I said, it's really um, uh, unknown. Uh, evidence does suggest that they were not just uh, f done for decorative purposes, purposes. Um, but uh, again, we don't know. Uh, a sympathetic magic, as I said, um, a number of animals are depicted that were not eaten. In fact, the bears sometimes are depicted and bison and uh, they are depicted as well, and uh, whereas uh, that's not what people ate at the time. Um, what you see here, uh, there's a bullock on the right and one on the left, uh, clearly uh, visible. And what's interesting from our point of view, I might as well start um, throwing certain, um, uh, certain terminology at you. Uh, the point of view of a composition, uh, even though it appears that the bullock, both of them, stand on a solid ground level, they really aren't. What provides ground level is the, uh, is the rock itself. Otherwise, they're really sort of floating, uh, floating in space. They, the form is very clearly depicted with, as I said, perhaps black charcoal. And uh, uh, the, uh, what we see as a slight modeling, modeling meaning an appearance of three-dimensionality is provided by the irregularity of the rock. What we also see here is the so-called uh, twisted perspective. A uh, perspective, we all know what perspective is, we look at something and the way it appears to us, that's perspective. Now, if we were to look at this bullock from the side, in profile, as he stands, we would only see one horn. However, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the painters, uh, whoever depicted this, wished for us to have as much information as possible. And, um, and horns usually from, well, in our experience, uh, or in the experience at least of, the, um, uh, of civilizations that we know about because writing uh, appeared about 3000 BC. So all these civilizations that we can read about, horns were associated with masculinity. So it is possible then that they were associated with masculinity as well. Um, well, we are still in the pandemic and, uh, uh, and uh, I have my daughter here who helps me, of course, who set up this, uh, uh, this YouTube. Uh, uh, she has um, 
some questions. Hi everyone. I was just gonna ask that are we is it that it's um flat drawing that just depicts multiple limbs? Because it kind of because mm -hmm. I know that's a later thing with the Egyptians and show drawing two arms mm -hmm. even though you're only seeing the side of the body. But is that the case here? Because you look at the bull on the right uh -huh. and his body is not completely parallel with the wall. I mean, you, you see his front. You see his front, you see both legs. Slightly, yes, because it and was... And you, you, you see the head, both sort of tilted. I, I, it just seems like it's not a complete parallel. I mean, did they... Because it seems like they knew perspective. I mean, it's not a flat image. It's a slightly... I mean, even the, even they even continue it into the back legs. I mean, you see one back leg and a phallus or an udder, whatever, whatever. I suppose it's a phallus since it's a male bull. And then the other leg, I mean, there is a tilt to... Oh, that's what's called the, the twisted perspective, because uh, uh, they didn't understand the perfect perspective, of course. But they wished to convey the idea of a bull mm -hmm. very much, which they do very well. But they also wanted to give as much information about this bull as possible. As a result, parts of the body, they would twist slightly, so yeah. we see more of it. Yeah. Uh, the, um, so some theories hold that uh, they may have been, these paintings may have been a way of communicating with others. Other theories ascribe religious ceremonial purposes, as I have mentioned. Um, they are very similar, these paintings around the world, and mostly animals are depicted, because when, when humans are depicted, it's usually, they're usually hands or stick figures. The, um, the right, as, as, uh, as it says. So here you can see more of the hole, and you can see how, how the formation of the rock, in fact, very much helps to model to model the figure, and the rock too is um, polychrome. It's multicolored. Now here again is our our bull, and he comes from Altamira, from um, from the cave in Spain. In fact, that's the plan of the cave that I showed you in uh, in the beginning. And as you see, then either the bull was in fact painted on top of another animal, and you can see here the red ochre. Or that other, no, probably the bull was painted on top of it, because as you see, the black line goes right above um, the other form. Uh, Lascaux caves in uh, the south of France. I was just talking about the twisted perspective, and uh, in, in, in most cases, it is very much the, um, uh, the situation where the body is in profile, and but the horns, the legs, necess not necessarily so. Whereas here, in fact, yes, there's more of a profile depiction. So there are always, uh, there are always exception, exceptions from the rules. Uh, these look like lionesses, uh, bison, rhinoceros. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the world was very different, of course, at the time. As I said, it was much, much colder. People lived in, um, uh, in caves and uh, all sorts of animals uh, were around that have been extinct since. Uh, this is the case of uh, uh, the um, uh, of the hand painting, and they're done in two ways, uh, negative and positive. So the negative, you see the white, the white impressions. That's where a hand is placed against the wall, and then the, um, the powder is blown around it, thus providing sort of a negative space where where the uh, color did not hit. On the other hand, there are uh, positive. Uh, impressions as well, and that is presumably where an outline was done of a hand and then the, the inside was painted. So this negative positive uh, uh, impression we will, uh, we will meet with that again, whether in painting or in sculpture. Uh, and here uh, in Chauvet, in the caves, uh, this is a, a hunting scene and you see here that people very much are presented as stick figures. So while um, uh, while animals are very well depicted with a uh, great deal of observation, uh, the human figure is entirely abstracted and uh, essentially presented to us. Of course, we understand it's a human figure, but uh, they were clearly not interested in, in any, any degree of naturalistic depiction uh, of men. Uh, one of the most famous uh, um, images in uh, art history is the so-called Venus of Willendorf. And she's called Venus of Willendorf because she was found in Austria. Now, I'm pronouncing, I know I have an accent, but uh, in German it would be Willendorf. 
in English, of course, it's W, Willendorf. Uh, well, <laughs> so either pronunciation is, um, is fine. But, um, uh, well, obviously, uh, the uh, people who made her did not call her Venus. The, uh, these female figurines are very common, in fact, uh, everywhere throughout Europe, uh, in, um, the, uh, in the Near East, uh, Asia, in, um, uh, in Africa, um, they're just very, very common. In fact, at this date, uh, and you see it's about 30,000 BC, uh, we don't really see male figures, but we see a lot of female figures. They were all, they were all nude, and um, uh, the 19th century scholars, once they, all, they, once they began to find them, uh, just uniformly called them Venuses, because Venus is uh, like uh, Venus in, in Latin, Aphrodite in, uh, in Greek is the goddess of love, goddess of, uh, goddess of procreation, and uh, goddess of fertility. And every civilization had a goddess of fertility because procreation was incredibly important. Well, no less for these people than for those who lived 20,000 years later. Uh, life was very, very hard. Uh, child mortality, tremendous. Uh, so I, I gather would be um, female mortality in childbirth. So women died in childbirth. Men died uh, hunting, fighting. Uh, it was very important to produce new life and uh, because a female body in fact does produce new life it is very possible that that is why uh, these figures appear. If you look at this very closely what's really emphasized are the procreative parts of the body. The uh, breasts are enormous, the, uh, the stomach is considerably larger than it would have been even during normal, normal pregnancy while the tiny little arms right there above, uh, above the breasts are uh, inconsiderable. And um, the, um, the pubic area is emphasized, whereas, uh, <laughs> whereas her brain isn't. Uh, no one needed the brain. Uh, what she has on her head, it's either hair or some sort of a hat. We don't really know. Uh, the legs, again, are practically non-existent. So what's really emphasized and, uh, and clearly respected are the procreative elements of her anatomy. Now, while she is uh, composed of these, um, of these, I mean, uh, art historically very, stylistically very impressive ovals and ovoids, in fact, she's very, and she appears quite large, but she's actually quite small. Um, hold on, there. She is, uh, she, she can fit into, into one's head. Parts of the body are associated with fertility, possibly fertility fetish. Uh, figure has no visible face, right, we talked about that. And um, there you have her from every side. Uh, as I said again, she is uh, she's a very famous image and uh, anyone who begins the study of, uh, of art history, and that is with the uh, art history from the very beginning, um, will know about her. The, uh, uh, the original, the original is in Vienna, in, in Austria, but again, the New York Natural History Museum uh, has a copy. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> and as I said, she's very popular, so people actually make uh, s snow venuses in the winter, which is adorable. Um, also an interesting part is that uh, uh, when, uh, 100 years ago, when one was looking for different ways of representation when uh, with the advance of modern art um, and the search for new forms because the old forms ever since Renaissance became, um, well, one became uh, perhaps uh, tired of them and was looking for new expression, um, one went back into very, very deeply, deeply ancient times to look for those forms, to look for forms that that were not guided by correct rules of the Renaissance. And, um, and here, for instance, an example, uh, a rather famous uh, Russian sculptor, Alexander Arhipenko, who a hundred years ago also produced his own Venus, and clearly he also was not interested in what she had to say, because uh, as you see, um, the face and the head uh, are hollow. Uh, just 
just to show you a number of other uh, similar images that come from different different parts. They all still emphasize very much the um, procreative parts of the body. Um, there is one uh, such figurine that comes from the Czech Republic, and uh, it's actually ceramic, uh, and it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest. No, actually, yes, the oldest known ceramic in the world, and um, uh, it predates the firing of clay. So, uh, whatever temperature they use, whatever fire they used was, was very low, not the real firing of clay. Uh, here she is again from back, from the side, and uh, same thing here. Uh, this one is in baked clay. Now, she's considerably later, she's 6,000, but as you see, these things really don't change because the priorities of procreation remain very much with us. And um, she is called, well, uh, a seated woman. Uh, she's not just a seated woman, she's also a birthing woman. She is, in fact, birthing a child, and you can see the head between her legs. Uh, reason, now she's sitting on the throne with the two felines for, uh, for armrests, and uh, the reason you see the head and one of the felines sort of a different plates because, um, because they were restored later. Uh, still another one from Sicily. So you see it's just throughout all these years, 20,000 years, uh, humanity continued to produce a nude female and it will continue, continue to produce a nude female into uh, our own times. Uh, purposes uh, may shift, aesthetics definitely shift, uh, rules shift, uh, tastes shift, but the principle remains the same. The, uh, that the, female, bo the female body, whether uh, appearing procreative or uh, lovely and uh, wistful as in Botticelli, still holds uh, a great interest <coughs> for humanity and for the artists. Uh, now, these two are fascinating because they, they differ considerably from the procreative purpose that we've been uh, uh, seeing. And um, they come from Romania, uh, and uh, the man is called uh, the thinker, sort of after Rodin, and the woman is just a sitting woman. And this is really the first time when uh, it appears uh, that psychological uh, uh, elements have now entered art, and that art perhaps is produced as art for art's sake, rather than for a certain definite purpose. Um, in fact, it looks tremendously modern uh, when uh, when Cezanne issued his uh, uh, his famous dictum about uh, everything being reduced to to cubes, cones, and spheres. I mean, here's a, here's a good example. And uh, to our modern eyes, unquestionably, they appear very attractive. And um, this comes from about 3500 BC. Now, by this time, civilization is pretty much. Uh, um, in, in full development in, uh, in the Near East, in the areas of Mesopotamia, today's Iraq, and Egypt, and will travel to Meso Mesopotamia presently. It's because you're talking about, you mentioned Cezanne and how it looks like something he would do, but if Cezanne were to do this, he would do this with you know, a bottle of champagne and a, a, lovely, a lovely street outside and food in his belly. I mean, they look so desolate. Right. And they yes, they, this, these. These people do look desolate, and that's very true. The, they would have been carved by people who had nothing. I mean, they had fire, hopefully, and caves, yes. we hope. Yes. But to I take know. the time out mm -hmm. of your... And when, you, when you're... The idea that they were struggling to survive, and that every moment that they were not sleeping or eating, they were trying to find more food or more shelter, and that they actually took the time out of that to express their loneliness and mm. their sorrow. I mean, that gives it a, a, a level... A whole new level, yes. Which simply can't, like, no... I mean, of course, the, the, in modern art, you, you express your inner desolation, but it's not the same as it was the desolation of their entire being. I mean, their inside right. and their outside. They, they were struggling to survive, but they took time out of their daily struggle to create art. That's, that's true. That's really cool. Right. Yeah. That's yes, definitely. Great. Cezanne created his art, his paintings, in great, great comfort of, uh, uh, of 
a wealthy lifestyle. Right. So I mean, yeah. sure, it could have conveyed the inner anguish, but the, the just the technicality of it, even just that, that someone said you took the time. I mean, I'm, I'm cold. I'm hungry, and I'm scared. And instead of just focusing on making sure that I get less cold, less hungry, and less scared, I I, I want to commit this to memory and right. create something that someone will remember how I felt. That that's, yeah, that's insane. That, that is that's very. But there's a human being who did that once. That's true. Hmm. Fifty-five hundred years ago, right? <laughs> um, and thus, as I said, and thus we go now. We we jump over. Um, well, actually, we have arrived now. We have arrived to uh, 3500 BC, so it's a good time to go to the Near East. And um, uh, we'll be looking at the two cultures that, uh, that were of tremendous importance for later uh, European civilization and, of course, development of art in Europe. And um, the, uh, the two cultures are Mesopotamia, and it's right here. It's today's Iraq, and Egypt, right there. Now, Meso. Mesopotamia, remember our Mesolithic uh, period, which is between, uh, the period in between. Um, so Mesopotamia, Potamos is a river. Mesopotamia is two rivers. One river is Tigris and the other Euphrates. Tigris, easy to remember, closer to, the, uh, to India, where Tigris roam. And uh, Euphrates, EU, closer to Europe. So that's how I remember this a long, long time ago. But so the land between two rivers is called Mesopotamia, and here it is, and this is where we are about to go. It is called um, today the Fertile Crescent because everything underneath the crescent is desert, everything above is barely habitable as well. But this, the, uh, the area between the rivers and into Palestine, it's sort of, it's, you see, it's shaped shaped like a crescent, and this is where civilization began. And it's called the Fertile Crescent. And we are in a period between 3500 and 2500 BC. But even there, it began really at the, at the Persian Gulf, right there, at the uh, sort of at the deltas, because the, both Tigris River and Euphrates River flow north-south, while the Nile flow, uh, flows south to north. And um, the civilizations began right here. Now, it's good to remember that the Persian Gulf at that time extended considerably uh, further northwest. And uh, so at that time, Tigris and Euphrates did not yet form a mutual bond. And we go to the civil civilization of Sumer. Um, we have no idea where they came from. They were not a Semitic people. They established a um, sort of confederation of cities. They were not a united kingdom or a federal king or a federal um, society in, in any way. Each town had uh, its own government, its own king, its own uh, its own god, and its own structures. And the most important of them, as you see, Ur, Uruk. Well, we'll be looking at Ur and Uruk. And with time, Lagash, Umakish, Babylon will, of course, be very very important. And that's, that's where we go. And um, Mesopotamia, this is how you spell it. And we'll look through several periods. Uh, unlike Egypt, that sort of had a unified culture for 3,000 years, well, maybe 2,000. Uh, Mesopotamia, well, the culture was, the culture itself, the, uh, the writing, the alphabet, um, was, and the art forms were very similar, but different tribes replaced uh, previous tribes, and as a result, the first, the third millennium is uh, Sumer, Sumer, Lagash, Lagash, right here. So it's Sumer, Lagash, and Akkad. We don't know where Akkad is, it hasn't been found. Um, many suspect that it is the same place as it, that it lies underneath Babylon. But the first, I mean, excuse me, the, the third millennium we see. Uh, those three cities dominate the scene. And then, um, and then in the second century, Babylon will dominate it. And then after that, into the first millennium, Assyria. And then, of course, we go into Greece, Alexander the Great, etc. So let us begin with, uh, with Sumer. 
probably the most revolutionary, the most extraordinary things that the Sumerians did um, by by the year 3000, uh, 3000, so already in the, perhaps in the late fourth millennium, they, uh, they began to record things. They began to write them down. And they did it with uh, a sharpened reed that they called stylus. Here, but the, here's one of them. There were clearly many variations. And they did it, they did their recording on, um, on clay tablets while these clay tablets were still wet. And then these clay tablets would dry in the sun or be fired in, uh, in the kiln, and uh, they could break, but uh, they still were sort of indestructible because even when they broke, many of them are broken, the ones that we found, but they could still be put together. Yes? It's actually so cool because you know, we talk about, of course, the loss of the Great Library of Alexandria, which I know you'll talk about later, and you know how much knowledge was lost, but when we talk about, for example, the tablet of the Great Library of Ashurbanipal, uh, it a lot of it is intact. Yeah. I mean, it, it's shattered, and you know. it will be the bane of many archaeologists' existence to come as they pick through the world's worst puzzle um, and try to put it all back together. But it exists. I mean, it's not lost to history. The fact that it was put on clay means right. that it yes. has endured. Yeah, in the form of the world's worst puzzle. <laughs> yes, and uh, they kind of even developed uh, well uh, the original, uh, original uh, rather simplistic form of uh, of democracy. But they did. They. It's fascinating to uh, to know uh, about the Sumerian culture, and there are books that are named the same way. So, so the the name Sumerians invented everything, uh, and uh, the. Uh, they, of course, invented the, the potter's wheel and wheel in, in general. All of that was invented in Sumeria. They were, um, they were great engineers. They were the first irrigators. They, uh, they, watched, they were uh, sky watchers and uh, they, could, uh, they could predict uh, certain natural occurrences uh, by their observation of the sky. They had schools. They had law courts. Uh, they lived uh, the life that is very that is very familiar to us. They, uh, had, they had hate mail. They had hate mail. There, there are literally letters yes. in they on, had, they on, had texting. On, 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 on Sumerian tablets, there are literally ta uh, tablets like a Yelp review where one guy writes to another guy, "Your wheat is just the worst possible wheat I have ever had the misfortune of receiving, and I will not be sending you the allotted amount of money." for your terrible wheat, and I'm letting everyone know how bad your wheat is, so there. <laughs> and there's another one where a man writes to a, a concubine, he wrote to her saying, I thought that I was your favorite supplicant, and I hear now that you wander the river with so-and-so, my greatest rival. Uh, you have until the fifth moon to collect your beautiful sandals, lest I donate them to the temple. I mean, the equivalent of come pick up your stuff right now. Right, and then get out of here. Right, it's so, yeah. it's so yeah. funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, just before this period, during the Neolithic, the so-called Neolithic Revolution, I mean, it began during the Mesolithic period, but really the Neolithic Revolution um, between 12,000 and 5,000 BC, um, there was a great, uh, there was global warming. There was a great global warming all around, and people came out of the caves, and slowly but surely, now I'm talking about thousands of years, uh, but hunting and gathering was then changed to, um, uh, to cultivation and um, cultivation of wild grain, cultivation of animals, to sedentary existence as opposed to nomadic existence. And uh, that, of course, created a completely new society because while the hunters and gatherers pretty much uh, shared everything they had, now, now hierarchical levels of uh, society began to establish themselves. Uh, but, but back to writing. So, but that also was the time of, uh, of first settling in villages, then from the villages to small towns, small towns to larger cities, and definitely the cities like Ur and Uruk were fairly large cities and, uh, and uh, quite sophisticated cities. So back to writing. 
Um, it clearly also began as a pictograph. Uh, and uh, here is just a very rough example of what it may have been. Here you have the development from, for instance, bull's head, and it looks like a bull's head. And then with time, it was just inconvenient to draw a bull's head, and it was much more convenient to do shorthand. Are with the stylus and shorthand then turned out to be this. So if this is 3000, this is 2500 BC, and then um, by the time of Assyrians, we get something like this. That uh, that can mean not just a bull. It can perhaps mean a whole herd. The bull fell over. <laughs> the bull fell over. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Uh, it could mean grazing lands. I mean, it could mean who knows. But uh, here's a bull, and then again. Uh, it, Finally, it obstructed itself into meaning bread, into meaning food, into meaning dinner, into meaning, again, uh, various combinations of things. So the pictograph developed into a so-called cuneiform. Cuneiform is wedge writing, and because when that stylus uh, makes a mark on wet clay, it looks like a wedge, as you see here, and thus developed um, the um, Mesopotamian uh, cuneiform, and whoever, whatever civilization will uh, replace the previous one, will still be using cuneiform, sort of as uh, uh, whether it's English or German or French or Italian, we're still using the same alphabet, and uh, and the concepts now became syllabic and um, and in fact and well with time alphabetic. Uh, here, head and ball, which will develop into a concept of of eating. Um, uh, lower Mesopotamia uh, did not have any any stone. They didn't have stone, they didn't really have much wood, everything had to be uh, brought in. The wood had to be brought in from Lebanon, stone had to be brought either from Egypt or from the northern areas, from the country, uh, from the uh, uh, from the mountains. Uh, so they developed, uh, they, uh, they fired brick and, uh, and they built everything in brick, whether it was fired brick or uh, sun-dried brick. Uh, it was brick. This, the, the closest thing today that I could find is there is a village in Morocco which is um, a UNESCO, uh, as a UNESCO site and it's a fortified village made entirely in clay. Oh, that's very cool. Yes. Oh, wow. And this, uh, this is contemporary. Uh, one actually can go visit. That's crazy. Yeah. And so uh, this is our best idea perhaps of what these uh, towns may have looked like. We also have to uh, uh, keep in mind that they were probably painted because all ancient civilizations loved color. So they would probably go to town painting these uh, the surfaces in, in various uh, uh, colors. So here are uh, this ex example of mud bricks. That's what they call mud bricks. And today also you go to Egypt, for instance, you see a lot of mud brick constructions as well. And here's our town. Um, however, the uh, well, these are reconstructions, of course. These are artistic reconstructions of what these uh, towns may have looked like. Ur, Uruk, who knows. But uh, these are around uh, uh, this central area. Uh, there are these um, uh, mud brick uh, buildings. But in the center, there would, be an admin there would be a palace. There would be a king's palace and, of course, um, a, a temple and a priestly court. So the temple would look like this. It's, it's, uh, it's called a ziggurat. It's a stepped pyramid. If it, uh, if it looks to you like something we have in Mesoamerica, you're right, it does. Um, these ziggurats come in, uh, in different heights, different shapes, and uh, they were essentially a solid brick. Because from wherever the people came, uh, the Sumerians, uh, clearly their gods lived on high, as gods often do. Think. Uh, think Moses uh, going up Mount Sinai to receive his uh, Ten Commandments. Mount Olympus. What do you mean Mount Olympus? And then I'm seeing another example. Oh, another one, of course. Yeah, another example. Another of example, of course, is, uh, is oh. the Mount Olympus. Right. Yes. A bunch of gods sitting on a very climbable mountain. No, no question. still up there. Yeah, Roman temples were also built up on the So I was not saying that Moses climbed Mount Olympus. <laughs> you look so, you look very concerned. I know, because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of in my... Uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, okay. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, uh, so gods live on high, and Mesopotamia, and that particular area of Mesopotamia is very, very flat, no mountains. So they created their own mountains, and uh, for easier access, they, uh, uh, they created them as step pyramids with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the 
courses of stairs leading up to to every level. Um, the and as I said, the prince, the, the kingly palace would be there. Uh, priesthood would live there. All king's attendants would live there. I mean, cities developed, and as cities developed, there is a division of labor. Uh, one just can't help it, and uh, so the surrounding area uh, feeds the city. The city now has professions and uh, produces commodities which now the city can export and thus civilization develops. Uh, here for instance we'll see it again. This is an image of ancient uh, Babylon and here and it's illustrated there, uh, I, I got it from Archaeology Illustrated by, by a very very marvelous Balaj Balo who is a, a brilliant artist and he does these recreations of uh, ancient civilizations which are, which are very compelling. And here he recreates uh, ancient uh, Babylon sitting, um, here's the river, and that ziggurat was the tallest. And as you see, very often the ziggurats were in, in, in different colors. The lower courses would be brown, black, then white, then blue, red. Uh, as I said, ancient civilizations liked color very, very much. Um, this is the complex, the palatial and priestly complex, and then, and then mud brick. Uh, dwellings over there. Um, now, let's see. First, we're going to go to the town of Uruk, right there, above Ur. And there was built the most ancient ziggurat. Uh, and it's called, today it's called the White Ziggurat, and it is determined that it was in fact built between 3500 and 3000 uh, BC. It is in, uh, it's about well, of course, it's in a sorry state. It's been 5,000 years. But this is what we have of it. And uh, the, um, uh, the reconstruction was possible. So this is what it looks like in reconstruction. There was one solid base right here of just solid brick. And then the steps would lead up and then the temple would be uh, on top. Only, only a king or priests would be allowed into the temple. Now, these were, of course, were all polytheistic societies, so every town would have different gods. And, um, and again, the colors are different between the base and the temple. Here is another reconstruction, which is compelling. I mean, we don't know what these temples look like, you see. Uh, we have descriptions, but still, that's not uh, as accurate as, of course, we would have known otherwise. But it, it was fairly, it was maybe 100 feet, uh, the whole structure, 100, 150. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, it's very old. It goes back to 3500 uh, BC. Uh, on the other hand, the next town, the town of Ur, where presumably Abraham came from, Abraham of the Bible. Well, today it is, um, it is slightly controversial because Abraham was a nomad and Ur was a place of very civilized people. So he would either have to change his uh, lifestyle entirely to a nomadic lifestyle, lifestyle, which is unlikely, or perhaps he came from uh, somewhere else on the Euphrates River, uh, perhaps Mari, which was under the domination of Ur at the time, which is more likely. But the Bible tells us Ur. Ur here, but that also might mean Ur, the whole territory that was under the influence of Ur. At any rate. So we go to Ur, and now a ziggurat at Ur was, but, but uh, it was built about a millennium, maybe more later. It is considerably taller, and uh, it is clear that well, the, um, um, a great deal of vegetation uh, was planted on the, uh, uh, on the platforms of the ziggurat, uh, which is why ultimately the Babylonian hanging gardens um, come from. I mean, they're terraced gardens essentially and uh, the vegetation was tremendous. I mean today it's all very bare but these people were, uh, were extraordinary, uh, extraordinary uh, botanists, agronomists and uh, they brought the river from, uh, they, they brought the water from Euphrates through very very sophisticated irrigation canals and pulleys um, and lifts everywhere whether whether on top of the mountain in in between so this is the ziggurat of ur and as you see it now has one two three four four platforms and then the temple is um on top uh here is another recreation that perhaps is clearer um as you can imagine uh one uh, one did not uh, need treadmills if one just wanted some exercise 
um, under a very, very hot sun. And even though you're not allowed into the temple proper, no one forbids you essentially from walking up and down those steps. And the steps were steep, like Mesoamerica. Uh, unfortunately, this is what's left today. And it's not even due to natural destruction. Um, when Mesopotamia was discovered uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century, and um, the British were there first, and um, uh, well, I mean, they saw these um, mounds and uh, didn't quite know what they were, but then they sort of began to pick here and pick there, and then these mounds turned out to be um, these ziggurats or or they covered ancient cities or what have you. And, and at first it was unclear to them what the top of the mount was, and uh, so the top was destroyed. In the end, the top was destroyed, and uh, we only have the base. Um, so the height is speculative. Presumably it's about 210 feet high, but it's speculative because, again, we don't have, we don't have the top of it. Uh, whereas the, the, the white ziggurat is probably 100, you know, 100, a little more than 100. Uh, this is what it looks like from, uh, from air. And these are the staircases that lead you to the, uh, uh, to the temple. Uh, very often, uh, glazed tiles were used for decoration. They were not just uh, somber brick. They were always decorated. And often, beautiful glazed tiles were used for that purpose. You can see them here, recreated. Oh, that's stunning. I know. Oh, wow. And, oh, wow. Uh, and again, as I said, remember, uh, different layers would be done in different colors. Um, a fascinating find under one of the temples in Sumer was of these uh, 12 figurines, 10 male, um, uh, 2 female, Despite the fact that the Sumerians were writing at the time, we really don't know. Do they represent gods? Do they, uh, do they represent worshippers? Most probably worshippers, they probably were votive figurines. Votive meaning uh, someone wants to worship God. Obviously, someone is busy. He cannot be there or she all the time. Um, so therefore, this someone will place a votive figurine in the temple that with very large open eyes, uh, forever aware, and constantly uh, and constantly praying and constantly expressing uh, its devotion to the deity. So possibly that's what they were. Um, so men, men have very long cur curly, curled uh, beards. The uh, women, uh, there's one woman and another woman, uh, they have uh, sort of off the shoulder uh, garments. Most of them are standing. There's somewhere there was a child next to one of the women, but uh, only feet remained. Um, the uh, eyes, well, it became very much, uh, very much a tradition in uh, Mesopotamian society to, to convey these eyes, very, very large and, uh, and very open. So these may be the votive figurines. Now, just as uh, we discussed prehistoric art and those beautiful, um, and the, our thinker and the seated woman from, um, from Romania, these two look very modern. These two look very cylindrical, very cubic, and that's what they are. They are as I said, Mesopotamians did not have stone. Uh, they did not want to waste stone that they did import, and therefore most of these figurines are made of clay. Uh, also imagine that they were perhaps uh, all painted. Uh, here, this gives you the range of height, and eight of the figurines made from gypsum, which is kind of sort of uh, like asphalt-like material appearing in nature. Then two limestone, and one is from alabaster. Alabaster is the most expensive stone. This may be alabaster. He is the only, he may be a priest. He's the only one, he's clearly male, uh, but he has neither hair nor beard. Neither hair, I mean, on, uh, on his head, no beard. So perhaps he may be actually uh, the uh, votive, uh, a votive figure of a priest. Uh, the horde, they're called the, uh, the horde, uh, discovered in a temple dedicated to the god Abu, and, uh, and who was the Near Eastern god of fertility. We'll be returning to fertility many, many, many times because as I talked in the beginning about about its fertility was of great importance, whether among humans 
or in the fields, uh, wheat and barley. Uh, a female head in marble was discovered also uh, during the excavations uh, prior to 3000 BC that also has these enormous eyes. Uh, the uh, uh, This part, the, the parting in the head, probably indicated the groove, the groove, that's what I should say. Uh, so the groove on uh, on her head was probably the, the place where hair was attached because she was not just left to be like that. The uh, uh, the brows would probably be filled with butumen, which is uh, uh, which is uh, sort of a black uh, viscose, black viscose material. Would the hair have been real hair or would it no, have been sculpture No, no, it would probably be gold, hair. gold plate. Gold plate. Probably gold plate. Very that cool. could be hair. Would like, I'll, I'll show you. Okay. So, um, uh, and the eyes also would be a shell maybe used or a shell and then for pupils, who knows, precious stone could be used, semi-precious stone could be used, uh, semi-precious stone, malachite could be used for green, lapis lazuli for blue, whatever, whatever color eyes they wanted. Uh, Butamin again for black eyes. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's quite lovely. Now, here is what she may have looked like. Now, this comes, uh, this was uh, prepared, in fact, for, um, for, the, um, uh, for the headdress. But this is what uh, our our lady here uh, may have looked like when she was finished, because um, uh, the Sumerians, all ancient uh, people, loved loved jewelry and uh, loved uh, precious objects. And here is this beauty in uh, she. It's either her natural hair, or it's a wig. In Egypt, it would be a wig. And, and then the headdress is made of um, gold leaf and precious stones, which is um, uh, quite amazing. And one can actually see it in the University of Pennsylvania, because the University of Pennsylvania participated in um, excavations. So here is what this would look like. Uh, now, it is fascinating uh, to see how it was found. Um, the, uh, the skull was crushed, and then the jewelry was scattered around the skull, as you see. So this skull was kind of glued together by the archaeologists, together just as everything was found in its find site. Uh, it was preserved as is, glued together, and as is sent to London. And it was already in London that the glue was picked apart and the skull uh, restored, and uh, so was the um, uh, headdress restored as well. And uh, I think it was the British Museum in combination with the University of Pennsylvania that did the excavations. So therefore some artifacts are in the British Museum and others are at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. Uh, another brilliant artifact is this lyre. Uh, now all of these are found in royal graves because uh, what, what Mesopotamian did not have the same uh, idea of the, uh, uh, of the next life as the Egyptians. But they had clearly some sort of an idea because the royal graves had a great horde of, uh, uh, of things that one uses during lifetime. And here, for instance, also at that time, uh, third millennium, fourth millennium, they also practiced human sacrifice. So when the king died, a number of his um, uh, servants would be killed with him or her. And, well, in this case, uh, this is a liar. It's called a bull's liar because, as you see in the front, uh, is the head of a bull. Uh, yes? No, I was just wondering, is this only for kings or for royal? Because you, you said him or her. Was it also for well, queens? Too. Queens, okay. No, I was just yeah. wondering. That's no. why I was wondering. Yeah. So this is a bull's liar. And uh, bulls, the image of a bull, will be very, very important in all civilizations because the bull, just as a lion, represents power, represents royalty, uh, represents uh, fearlessness, and uh, so we'll see bulls a lot. So this is a bull. Uh, it is, um, what we see here is, um, uh, is uh, sheet gold right there that is, uh, uh, that is shaped around uh, a wooden head. So sheet gold shaped around a wooden head. 
the uh, beard on the bull is lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli was extremely expensive. It's called a uh, semi-precious stone, but uh, it's one of the most more, more precious of the semi-precious stones, as opposed to uh, malachite, for instance, which was very, uh, very common. And same eyes that uh, we see here, very large eyes and gilded horns with perhaps lapis lazuli uh, tips. Uh, the, um, the body of the lyre, of course, is, uh, is restored, is reconstructed. Now, the soundboard itself, as you see, is um, trapezoidal, and it has shell plaques that show various mythological object, uh, scenes. We don't exactly know, again, uh, what they refer to. It's very possible that they come from the, uh, the, the great epic of Gilgamesh that was written uh, long before Homer uh, put together uh, his um, Iliad and the Odyssey. The epic of Gilgamesh that comes from Sumer and was presumably composed about 2500 BC is the first uh, literary epic that uh, that we possess. And uh, it's possible, I mean, there's a scorpion man and Scorpios appear in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, and then uh, there's the master of uh, animals. I mean, uh, it is symmetrical, uh, identical on, on each side, and usually the, the animals are in a standing position. Uh, so, uh, but then again, they, they could just be uh, describing folk tales where animals behave as humans and uh, our folk tales, Aesop, of course, the, the Greek folk tale um, uh, writer. Here we have the lyre, very similar to ours, a bull lyre, that the, the bear is stabilizing and what the wolf or somebody is uh, uh, is playing. Then he, no, this one I think is a wolf with a knife, and he is carrying a table with, with various foods, and then the lion rampart uh, ramp, uh, is, is is carrying a jug of wine. So that's, we don't know what it is, but it's fascinating. Now it's done, of course, everything is flat. There's no modeling. Uh, what I was talking about uh, originally, there's no three-dimensionality. Everything is very flat. Another fascinating object that also was found completely flat and, and uh, squished, so to speak, is, um, is this ram or billy goat. It's it, also some sort of votive, uh, votive sculpture. Now, billy goats, of course, are notorious for their fertility, and uh, and because fertility was so important, so clearly every animal that uh, designated fertility would be emphasized. And um, and there is our billy billy goat uh, offering stand, and presumably to male fertility god Tammuz, but but we can't be sure. Uh, from about uh, the middle of the third millennium. Uh, he is, uh, I think I have the information, here he is in um, profile. So head and legs are, are in gold leaf, as is the tree, and then uh, the tree itself, I mean it's hammered gold again uh, around, uh, around the wooden, wooden trunk, so to speak. And um, now the horns, again, and fleece, uh, lapis lazuli, and uh, the body fleece is made actually of shell attached to a thicker coat of bitumen. And genitals are gold, but the belly was silver plate, but it's lost, unfortunately. The, uh, now, bitumen, bitumen, also known as asphalt or tar, is a black, oily, viscose form of petroleum, a naturally occurring organic byproduct of decomposed plants. Well, there you go.